Warning, the following program contains scenes of death. Seventies Wichita, Kansas, or Cowtown, as it was known. A peaceful little slice in the heart of USA's Bible Belt, where the only gay you're gonna run into is Gay McIntyre, who works at the corner florist. Tell her that bug sent you and she'll give you a deal. An old-fashioned, God-fearing, tight-knit community, where ass-fucking is still against the law, and you can buy an ice cold bottle of Coke for only ten cents. I know what I'd rather put my tongue in. Detached from the rest of America's fancy politics and hedonistic ways. But that was all about to change. It was a bit of cold Tuesday at around 4 o'clock when the Arturo's oldest son Charlie was coming home from school and discovered the rest of his family murdered. Upon first entering the crime scene, it almost appeared ritual-like. The intruder or intruders entered the property between 7.30 and 8 a.m. The father and the mother were tied up, beaten, tortured, and then strangled to death, now giving plenty of time to see to the kids. By all accounts, killing the kids was savored like a fine wine, with several plastic bags being tied over the young boy's head. Police believe the killer then pulled up a chair, and while the life drained from the young boy, he watched and masturbated. Then he grabbed the 11-year-old daughter and dragged her into the basement. Made a noose, stripped off her pants and her underwears, got inappropriate with her, then hanged her from a pipe. And he jerked off as she slowly died. There was enough cum on the floor to make a cum birthday cake. Although I don't know why he'd want to do that. Because it wasn't her birthday. The cops were baffled, because the only thing that anybody had ever killed and fucked in Wichita before were the cows. At least when you killed them, you could make a hamburger. Near Toros, while well, they were just wasted meat. There's only one law in Wichita. Can you dig it? Remember, kids, stay in school. Who? What's that? That jazz-ass motherfucker. There's murder, and then there's murder. I guess most people would agree that when you kill a kid, well, that's a different kind of crime altogether. All of Wichita were in a state of shock, an area known for being safe. While the kids were going to school, it seemed unfathomable. What made the tale even more tragic was the family just moved there. Their dream house, so to speak, would become a nightmare. A goddamn house of horrors. A well-liked, popular family. The father had no priors and had served in the military. Growing up, Dennis Rader was pretty unextraordinary. He wasn't good at school. He wasn't good at sports. I guess you could say that he was no good. But it is believed that there was one significant childhood event that would affect him more than any other. It was for a minor infraction that his teacher had humiliated him in front of the rest of his classmates. So that night, he got some rope Went to his teacher's house, climbed a tree, looked in a window, and as that rope, tightly wrapped around his waist, held him, he watched his teacher undress, and he masturbated. And that sensation of the rope squeezing his thighs and masturbating would become part of Dennis's modus operandi. In retrospect, to childhood friends, Dennis stood out as different. Uh, at a young age, he would go after uh, uh, like turtles and this kind of stuff, and and uh, and, uh, and as opposed to uh, to uh, maybe you know killing them the way a lot of us would have if it was a snapping turtle or something like that, they said that uh, he would hang them. Mixing his pleasure for killing and torturing small animals, the prepubescent boy 
had a passion for graphic comic books that depicted rape and torture. By his own admission, by the time he was in the eighth grade, his future was mapped out, and he was already experiencing deep and disturbing thoughts. It was one of Dennis's teachers that first saw signs of those deep and disturbing thoughts. When she was doing some marking, she noticed the child's artwork. And after he'd gone home for the day, she brought it to the attention of the principal. The principal told the teacher to stop being a busybody and that they weren't psychologists and leave that to the parents or those who know better. A missed opportunity, some may say. A chance to save lives, another may lyrically wax. It was also around this time, Dennis's mother caught him wearing her lingerie. You sick fucking fat. But she dismissed it as just a face. But it's to be noted that he regularly went out wearing this lingerie, staring into people's windows and jerking off. It seems the freak was now fully formed. And his autoeroticism was more than just a hobby. With the city in shock and still reeling over the Arturo murders, Radar were already on the road looking for his next victim. There was a good book that once said, Seek, and thou shalt find. And I don't know if 21 year old Catherine Bright had read that book, but there was one thing for sure her death clock was now ticking. Because Radar had been watching the young student for months, and now he figured it was time to make his move. Going in through the back door, he went into a bedroom and waited for her to come back. But he didn't expect her to come back with her brother, and all hell broke loose. Holding them both at gunpoint, he told them that he was a convict who escaped from jail. And he told them that he was wanted in California, and that he just wanted some uh, money, some food, and their car, basically trying to put them at ease, just thinking that he was going to tie them up and then leave. So he's lying to them? Yes. Because he indicated to you that he was his full intent was to kill Catherine Bright. That's correct. And now that Kevin walked in with Catherine, did he indicate to you what was going to have to happen with Kevin? Yes, he said, uh, he reiterated several times that he was going to have to get Kevin out of the way in order to accomplish what he wanted to with Catherine. And Kevin tied up Catherine. Uh, he tied Kevin up uh, in the first bedroom uh, directly to the left of the front door and tied Kevin to the bed. He then moved Catherine into the other bedroom and uh, where he subsequently tied her to a chair inside of that bedroom. He said that he turned on the stereo. Uh, he did that in order to muffle any uh, strangling or gagging noises so that Catherine wouldn't be able to hear uh, what he was doing to Kevin. As Rada strangled the teen, the kid broke loose and started to run, to which Rada pulled a 22 out of his back belt and shot him. Returning back to the bedroom with Catherine tied up, she was hysteric now, saying, what have you done to my brother? Rada assured her that her brother was fine, he'd only been wounded, and that when he left, he'd call an ambulance. But as Rada pulled out his cock and was starting to get the business, he had a nagging doubt. He returned, he returned back uh, to uh, Kevin to check on him, and, and as he came in, he kicked Kevin to see if he was still alive. And apparently, uh, Kevin got up and they started struggling again. And Raider said that during this struggle, Kevin was actually able to get a hold of his, and again, he showed where he had his uh, 357 Magnum and a shoulder holster. Kevin was actually able to get his finger on the trigger and they were struggling over the gun and Raider was trying to keep the gun from discharging, trying to get his finger in the, behind the trigger so that it wouldn't go off. And uh, while this struggle was going on, he pulled his 22 pistol again and shot Kevin again with the pistol. Going back to the bedroom with Catherine, she was now hysterical, knowing that he'd been lying. And it was then he decided to take care of business. For real. Stabbing the 21-year-old repeatedly. He was uh, wanting to strangle her. Uh, that wasn't working because she was fighting and, re and resisting. So uh, at that point, he said he pulled out a knife that he had with him and he used that to knife her with. She fought like a hellcat. Yes, he drew uh, one of his knives 
and uh, he talked about how he stabbed her uh, up under the ribs uh, in the back area, he believed. And then at some point he said that he spun her around and stuck her in the front. It was then, thinking that the woman was dead, he ass-fucked her and left. But little did Radar know that the girl was still alive and she called police. Uh, when he came inside, Catherine was laying on the floor in the living room, uh, face down in a pool of her own blood, uh, clutching a telephone in her hand. She was uh, in and out of consciousness at that point. And was she able to communicate uh, with this officer? Yes. He asked her uh, what had happened to her. She was able to lift up her blouse and show him some stab wounds uh, on her abdomen area. And uh, he was able to get from her her name. And he was able to ask her if she knew who the perpetrator was. And she said no. And she was bleeding profusely. That's correct. When Catherine asked the officers how her brother was, they told the dying girl that he was alive and that he needed her to stay alive. But I guess hearing that he was okay was enough. And she closed her eyes and slipped into the abyss. And at this point, the cops had no goddamn idea. They had known as the goodness serial killer in their midst. The brother, shot twice in the head, was now a semi-vegetable. So it wasn't going to be much good to the police. And all that he could remember was that his sister's killer was a Caucasian. Which, if we're being honest here, is pretty fucking useless information. It won't lead to any arrests. And Radar swears that if he'd brought his proper killing tools that day, the kid wouldn't be alive. If I had brought my stuff and used my stuff, uh, Kevin would probably be dead today. I'm not bragging on that, it's just a matter of fact. When police canvassed the area, there were several witnesses describing seeing what is known as beaners in the area or Mexicans to non-racists, three of them to be precise, and this was released to the newspapers. Now all of Wichita were as scared as a bunch of fleas on a burning kitten, and the sale of firearms, <laughs> well they went up like a cripple still sitting in his wheelchair attached to a hot air balloon. And the fact that they thought it were three beaners going around executing people, then jerking off on them, well, it made it even worse. Infuriated that someone else was being credited for his work, Radar decided to send the cops a little introduction letter and identified himself as BTK, Bind, Torture, Kill, and told him that he was the mastermind, not a bunch of fucking taco eaters, and that the killing wasn't gonna stop anytime soon because he had a taste for it. And nevertheless, it would be three more years until BTK was struck again. It was December of 1977. The Raider would commit his next heinous act. 24-year-old single mother, Shirley Vienne, were home with the kids. She was sick and had a bad case of the diarrhea. And although the young mother was with her three children, that didn't matter to Radar as he busted in the door and dragged the by hair into the bathroom. And even though she had the shits, he started ass-fucking her and strangled her to death as he came into her. Shirley's oldest kid said she'd seen a man hanging around all afternoon, knocking on the neighbor's door, but they wanted home. I guess in the end, he had to take second best. And now it seems ludicrous at the height of Radar's crimes that he worked for ADT Home Securities installing alarms to protect families when he was the ultimate threat, using that expertise to stalk his victims. BDK was now about to commit what he described as his perfect kill. In fact, the crime's so perfect, he couldn't wait for the cops to find it. So he phoned it in himself. You will find a homicide at 43 South Nancy Fox. It was on the 8th of December that pretty Nancy Fox returned home from a job at a jewelry store. Radar tortured, strangled her, and gave her the business. And he even wrote a pretty poem, and he sent it to the police. Called Ode to Nancy. I'm guessing that it would be hard to find words that rhyme with ass fucking. It also included a sketch of a cum covered carcass. It was then that the Wichita police announced to the press they now had a bona fide serial killer and they were working with the FBI. And they no longer believed that it was the three amigos that had done the killings. 
Because even a fucking beaner wouldn't be sick enough to write a poem about ass fucking. The Wichita police, and now the FBI, were at a loss. As the taunting letters kept coming in, it's not as if the killer were killing every month. He'd take a year off, two years, they didn't know when he'd strike again. In fact, they didn't even fucking know if he'd strike again. It were a conundrum. Wichitans had the sword of Damocles hanging over their heads, and all cops could do were wait for the killer to strike again. But Radar's killing techniques will get more clever. A volunteer scout leader, one weekend when he'd taken his troop on a camping trip, he slipped away in the middle of the night and returned home and chose a victim who only lived four houses from him and his family. The search began first thing this morning on the eastern edge of Sedgwick County for a woman who's been missing seven days. 53-year-old Maureen Hedge was last seen a week ago by a friend who'd taken her to dinner. She was home by 1 a.m. Saturday. Later that day, her door was found ajar, her phone lines cut, and Maureen Hedge was missing. While loved, a deacon in the church, detectives were baffled because she disappeared off the face of the earth only to make a triumphant return nine days later. When her rotting, nude body was found in a drainage ditch, next to two dead dogs. There was a dead dog there, and then right beside Ray's little father was a foot. The body was nude, and police say badly decomposed. A pair of knotted pantyhose were found lying in the ditch beside it. After Radar had fucked around with the Bible thumper, he set her up in a series of erotic pictures. You could even see the church robes in the background. It were an abomination to everything that were good and normal. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. After they'd found the old church broad, even the FBI were more confused than a retard with a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle. Because what they were looking for weren't your typical serial killer. Fat broads, good-looking ones, old ones. The killer didn't seem to have a quality control valve. As long as they had an asshole to fuck, they were good to go. But if cops were wondering when BTK were going to strike next, <laughs> And they had a bit of a wait. This was 1986 before he'd come out of hiding. So for seven long years, women had to sit and wait and wonder if they were on BTK's shit list. After the killing of Hedge, BTK will commit two more murders. First would be Vicky Wigley in 1986. It's around 11 a.m. The radar broke into a house and waited in a closet. And she came home from shopping at about one o'clock. I drew a pistol at her and asked her if she'd go back to the bedroom with me. He took her into the bedroom. He took care of business, torturing, strangling her, and then giving her a facial as a final thank you. And when her husband came home later that afternoon, fresh jizz still dripping off his tied up wife, he thought she might still be alive, but when he cut her loose, she was gone. It would be a latency period that lasted four years before BTK would strike again on 62-year-old Dolores Davis. Davis had just retired and was about to enjoy the rest of her life relaxing. Dream on. But complacency has killed more than one old tired bird. It was in the middle of the night while the woman was sleeping that a concrete block was thrown through a window. The woman must have been woken from her sleep, terrified to find her destiny standing before her. Radar strangled the woman with her pantyhose, then played with a dead body and masturbated on it. Investigators say a 15-year-old boy discovered the body early this morning while he was walking his dog. Discovered with three weeks worth of rot, looking a little worse for wear. Ten miles outside the city limits under a bridge, decomposed. The same M.O. as the others. Strangled, jizzed on. Beside the body was a mask. Mine was a goddamn ass fuckers Halloween party. The type that you wouldn't want to be invited to. Well, that is unless you're into someone jizzing all over your corpse. The city of Wichita were now on the razor's edge. Waiting 
for BTK to strike again, but little did they know that he was waiting, watching, because it would be 25 years before they'd hear from the bad boy of bondage again. Tonight, Wichitans are on edge. The serial killer who terrorized Wichita for years causes new fears. After a journalist told everyone he was planning to write a book about the killer and that he believed he was dead, well, Radar took great umbrage to this and started putting on a scavenger hunt for the pigs, sending them clues and messages and belongings from his victims to remind everyone that he was still alive and kicking. But it was when the callous killer sent detectives a computer disc with a file on it. Well, he literally served himself up on a platter because on that computer disc, it said where the software was licensed to and the computer of the last person that saved that file. And that person's name was Dennis. And the location of that computer was Christ Lutheran Church, Wichita. It was three days after opening that computer desk, the Wichita detectives came down on Dennis' radar, harder than a bunch of spastics playing tag with hammers. Legion forever! That book says no more.